Well, good morning. Welcome to the March installment of our Entrepreneurship Center lecture series. Um, thank you again for hosting us, Chebe Ute and Nova Centrum, for partnering with us on this. Today we have Peter Kesh. Uh, he has some very useful suggestions, very useful suggestions in terms of change management. Uh, I've heard this talk before and it's worth listening to again. So, welcome Peter and thank you. Thank you very much. So, also from my side, welcome to all of you. Um, thanks for joining or listening to this presentation. Um, before I start, maybe some words about myself. Uh, Peter Kesh, uh, 51 years old and more than 20 years of uh, consulting experience, especially in terms of management consulting, change management, uh, interim management, startups. Did a lot of startups during my career, um, mainly for my own or for the own company, which means opening subsidiaries, um, integrating partners, growing them up, making them profitable, uh, which also means changing the operation from the partner side, changing the environment. Uh, so a lot of things I did in the past, and um, yeah, uh, I'm currently um, active as um, independent consultant. And I support startups, mainly startups, but also uh, bigger companies in terms of strategy finding, go to market definition, um, especially, uh, let's say, customer segmentation and um, the right approach to yeah, talk to the customer and uh, how to get the most value out of, uh, out of the operation. Um, what this presentation is about, so what I'm going to talk tell you today. Today I would like to tell you, um, uh, discuss with you, let's say, my 10 favorite points, uh, which I always keep in mind when I'm asked to do a change management project or to implement some changes. There are a lot of methodologies out there, how to implement change, how to approach that, how to get prepared. But during my experience, I always um, realized that there are really 10 points which make it more, uh, let's say, which make the point, yeah, which you always have, should have in mind when you discuss about change management. So what this presentation is not about, it's not a how-to. Yeah. So uh, if you want to learn how to implement change management or how to be, uh, become a change management consultant, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information out there in the internet, so you can Google and you can search that. So this is not what I'm talking about today. Now, before I start with my 10 points, um, I would like to get, because we are a small group, so I could ask some questions. We would have 100 attendees here. That would not be possible. So uh, I'm a little bit interested because we can make that more interactive. So I do not want to stand here for one hour and uh, tell you a story and then say goodbye and we'll go to the weekend. So if you have questions, raise your hand. Uh, ask questions, and I'm very flexible so we can um, also discuss about completely different topics if the team or the group agrees. But first of all, I'm interested to learn a little bit why you are here. Because you had no other sessions or it's, uh, nothing to do or uh, Friday lunchtime. So, uh, why are you here? Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, so. Should we start from the first row here? So I was uh, sugar working for three years in a co biotech company uh, as an uh, R&D head, and so I was, you know, project management was my daily work. Actually, now I'm for one year at the university back and uh, in academia. So, so I'd like to simply to, you know, keep on track. Uh, and and uh, change management, of course, was something which, which we actually had not implemented very well in the company. Yeah. And the others are just interested in the topic. Okay. Well, so let's start. Uh, as I said before, um, just a collection of points. And the first point, of course, is don't be afraid of change. And um, it's really funny. Um, this is a very, very interesting point that 20% of people are against every change in general. Yeah, they do not like, people do not like change. And if you have to implement a change and you are calculating what do I have what do I have to expect in implementing a change? You have to count twenty percent 
or against the change just because. Yeah? Thirty percent are against of the change because it's touching a topic they don't like. And another twenty percent don't like to change because um, it involves changes in personality. Or it comes from you or from a different person we don't like. So there are a lot of reasons why people do not like change. But in general, if you go into a change management project, you have to count that more than 50% of people are against the change. And that's, we have to work with. But the point is, um, why are they afraid to implement some change? They are afraid, of course, in the economy we live today, uh, a lot of people are set free. They're afraid after the change, after restructuring, they will lose their job. Yeah. Or they, get, they will lose the control, yeah. especially middle management. Yeah. Top management, they always survive the change, except there's a big change, like a takeover or uh, acquisition, something like that. But typically, middle management is very much afraid of change. The employees itself, yes, they are afraid. But if you talk to them, they go with you. You can convince them, most of them. And of course, they are afraid. What will be the future? What will be after the change? And why they are afraid? Because typically, that's a reason of bad communication. Yeah. If you tell your people that, yeah, we have to change something, they would like to know why. What is the trigger? What is the expected outcome? What does it mean for me and my department? So there are a lot of questions. And if you don't answer the questions, they are afraid of change. But um, does it make sense to be afraid of change? And that's a really interesting point. Because um, the change will come anyway, if you are afraid of the change or if you are not afraid of the change. Yeah. If a change management project has been started, it will run. You can't stop it. So there's no need to be afraid of change. And uh, why um, are changes typically implemented? Let's talk a little bit about the reasons. Um, first of all, of course, the development of new opportunities. If a company wants to enter a new market, they need to adapt the organization. They need to uh, adapt their processes, they need to change. Or if they are changing the field of operation, you know, product portfolios change, then they need to change. Or if they see that they have just to improve because things go wrong. And uh, what we should do, we should ask ourselves the questions, um, do I want to support exploring new opportunities? Do I want to support the company? And if you say, no, I don't want that, you should, you better leave. Right? Because the company will go that way anyway. Or, do you not want to help improving things? Of course, everyone would like to help improve things. Uh, but only if they improve also their personal, let's say, benefits. So this is a kind of a um, problem which has to be um, addressed during the change. But in any case, I think it doesn't make sense to change, uh, to be afraid of a change, because the change will come anyway. And uh, it depends on you whether you contribute to the change, so be part of the change, or if you stand beside the change, and the change will just happen. Um, that's what I said before, the world is changing anyway. It's not like 50 years ago where things have been implemented and then they have been running for the next 20 years. IBM made that, for example. They implemented a lot of procedures and they've been running them for 20 years, 25 years, and then they run in, in serious problem. Right. Uh, they, it will change anyway. So today, nowadays, change, uh, let's say, frequency is um, one, two changes a year in the process, in, in average, in agile companies. And uh, if we don't want to do that, then we have a problem. So a change will come anyway. And um, as I said before, manage the change, otherwise the change will manage you. It will, it will happen. And um, 
always keep in mind that people are afraid of change. Even if they don't say that. A lot of people will tell you, yes, we have to do something, but please not this thing. Uh, maybe we do something in a different department, or maybe we do something uh, completely different, but, but don't touch my department, don't touch me, that's too painful. Right? So they are afraid yeah, by nature. Um, now, now we are not afraid of change anymore. You know, we have to do a change anyway. We have to implement the change. But um, really, a tricky thing. What I've seen so often, if you talk to a company who wants to do some changes in the operation or in the strategy, um, um, mainly in the operation, and you talk to them, then um, very often you figure out we do not have a strategy. To they have a pain point which comes out of the operation and the pain point triggers a change. But the change itself or the change uh, procedure or the change uh, initiative does not support the strategy work. If you are in a situation where you will be part of a change project, always ask yourself, what is our strategy? What is our target of the company? and um, understand the big picture first. I mean, you have to ask yourself, does our company or the company you have to implement the change at, does they have, do they have a well-defined strategy? Where do they want to be in five years? Yeah. What is their vision? What is their mission statement? <coughs> do they have a balanced core card set up? A um, lot of companies, especially mid-sized companies, they say, well, all this stuff is too much esoteric. I don't like that. Yeah. We know exactly what we want to do. We did it already in the last 20 years, and uh, no one needs to tell us uh, what our strategy should look like. But this is a big mistake. Um, strategy can really, or having a well-defined strategy, can help a company. It can help uh, the employees to identify themselves with the company. And you can use it. Define a mission. What is the mission? Define a vision for the company. And make sure you communicate it. And not only once, communicate it to the employees quite often. You, uh, I mean, you will have meetings in companies like staff meeting, which is typically once, twice a year, but you have also department meetings, you have project meetings, whatsoever. And what I always recommend is, of course, you shouldn't overdo that, but make the strategy, at least one, two points out of the strategy, part of every meeting. And you have to actually implement it in the brain of your employees, that they always keep the strategy in mind. They should ask themselves the question, okay, I have to do something, but will this, what I have to do right now, support the strategy? This is what, how they should think. They always should reflect they're doing, they're actually doing this strategy of the company. And if you manage to implement that in the brain of the employees, then you will see that your strategy is really, the execution of the strategy is really boosting. If you don't manage that, they will do yeah, things which are useful, but not necessarily support the strategy. And this goes down from top management till the working management. Um, of course, one very problematic point is this here. Opportunistic versus long-term strategy. This is something which you see very, very often. You have to define strategy, at least you think you have it, but then you have to make a decision. Shall I take now this project because I can make half a million euros uh, within the next six months, but it will not be in line with my strategy. It's a difficult decision to make. And most managers make the operational decision first, which means they take the opportunity. Why do they take the opportunity? Because they have to survive. No. Very difficult. Um, there's also no recommendation how to overcome this situation, 
because if you have to make a decision, shall the company survive with this project, but I go in a different direction, uh, then of course you will make the decision, yes, I, will, I would like to survive. And then I have to yeah, tell some stories to my employees, we will go the strategic approach next, next year, or we will uh, revert that, or whatsoever. But always be sure that if you uh, know exactly what your strategy is, then you should go for that. You don't need to change the company immediately uh, by 180 degrees. You can do that step by step. We will come to that back later. Another question, please. Yes, of course. Did so that the opportunistic uh, change actually is uh, driven by the mid-management and long-term changes of strategy from the top management? Uh, it's normally actually. yes. Normally yes. Um, but if you right. have mid-sized companies, then mid-sized company, if you have 50 employees, then um, uh, those, as you say, um, opportunistic uh, decisions are very often made by top management. On the size. Yes, it depends on the size. If you have a company, 200, 300, 400 employees, let's say up to 500, they should have uh, actually almost a department on their own if uh, they taking care about the strategy, uh, reflecting the operation of the strategy. Almost no company is doing that, checking whether the daily operation is in line with the strategy. Another question I might have is, let's say, the Strategy, uh, strategic vision is, uh, is probably some kind of sliding window you know, which changes over time, but there, there are also some periods where you know it changes, it, it changes dramatically. Yes. And so there might be some kind of m measure for change. I, I will come back to that later. Yes. Um, and uh, as I said before, this is something uh, what you should implant in the brain of your people or in your brain. Um, how will this change which I have to implement support the strategy? And if you say, yes, it's in line, it will support the strategy, then it's a good thing to do. But if you know and if you realize it's not in line, then you have to do something. You have to communicate with your people because otherwise they will be disappointed. You have to argue why you do that now, and you have to make very clear how this will then um, look like in the future. Yeah. Will you continue like this, or is this a one-time shot you have to make right now because otherwise the company is in big risk or big troubles? So make sure that uh, the proper strategy is defined and communicated. Uh, and I am, I'm not a big fan of too much esoteric in the strategy. Um, I've seen companies uh, which spend um, one, two years in defining the right strategy with a huge amount of consultants and uh, spend a lot of money doing that. Yes, big enterprises can do that. Of course, Microsoft will do that, uh, Google will do that, uh, Apple will do that. But uh, the companies we usually work with, they are not that big. Uh, they have uh, maximum 500 up to 1,000 employees. Um, they can't, they should not overdo that. But they should have a very clear vision, mission, and the initiatives that are defined which are going to implement the change supporting the strategies. So make sure you have it defined. And make sure the strategy is communicated. What I see quite often is companies say, yes, of course, now we have to define our strategy. So they sit together, management team, maybe they take one, two consultants, and uh, they define, they write some papers, a white paper, make some nice PowerPoint slides, then they make a staff meeting, they do a presentation, and that's it and they shake their hands and uh, say, well done, and uh, then the thing is over. This will not work. We will disappoint people in that. And the point is you have really to live the strategy. What does it mean, living the strategy? Living the strategy, as I mentioned already before, repeated communication. 
repeat the strategy in the staff meetings, uh, in the project meetings, in department meetings, repeat it. And always ask your team, involve them. Yeah? Are the things we are doing in line with the strategy? Make it part of the meeting culture. Only then you will involve the people. And communicate it repeatedly. And communicate how a change will support the strategy. That's also a tricky point, because of course you don't know how it will the change look like at the end. So will it really bring 20% more customers? You don't know, but you expect it. And this has to be communicated. We do this change because we expect an improvement in getting new customers, for example, or an improvement in the complaint management process, that the complaints can be handled twice as fast as today. You have to communicate that. And then you have already defined your KPIs. Yeah? You communicate what you expect by implementing the change. And provide feedback. If you do some uh, change uh, uh, initiative, if you implement that, you have to communicate that and give feedback to the people. We started this initiative four weeks ago. Now, after two, uh, uh, after two weeks, we saw the first positive results, but after four weeks, we figured out it will not work. There's no problem with that. Um, what I've seen very, very often is that people are too much afraid to communicate failures. Ah, I can't tell it now, right? It was my idea, but if I tell the people now I was wrong, they will not trust me anymore, or they will not follow me anymore. This is completely wrong. The people will not trust you when you do not communicate, when you hide things, when you are hiding things. I always say there is nothing wrong in communicating a failure. And if you implement or involve your people in the decision making, then it's also their decision. You are, people are typically only afraid to communicate there was something wrong if it was their personal decision, if they force some things. Because then they get in the critics, okay, you've, you intended uh, to make this change, yeah, uh, but now we see it's a failure. This is bad thing, a bad situation. But not only because it failed, but because someone pressed the rest of the people or forced them to do something. Sometimes it's necessary. Yeah. If you have to lay off 50% of your employees, you cannot involve them, shall we do that, let's vote, uh, it will not work. So don't be afraid to communicate failures. But also communicate the success of the change. And this communication must be part of a daily business. Because otherwise the company will not lift the change, the company will be like an operation, someone will come in, will cut some things out, or will replace some things, and then we leave and say, okay, now it's your turn to recover. Because then you need a recoverment after the change implementation. And if a change is implemented right, you don't need recoverment. You can operate immediately. So we have strategy defined, we know now where we want to go and we know how we are going to approach that, but before we are going to define the initiatives, which means with which exactly changes I want to implement, I always say, please make sure that you understand why things go wrong. Yeah? Um, if you don't know where you stand right now and why you are standing here, you cannot implement initiatives which will improve the situation. Because if you misunderstand actually the trigger, the initial trigger of the bad thing, then you can't change it. So always make sure to understand why things go wrong. Um, and one of the points you should look at in the first instance of the motivation of the people. So the people who are involved in the processes which do not run correctly. 
how are they motivated? I've seen it so often that, uh, for example, in a sales department, uh, you had people responsible for filling the funnel, which means they have been responsible for getting new contacts, yeah? uh, running the fairs, um, um, getting the business cards from potential customers, and they are motivated by the amount of new contacts they bring. On the other side, the people who are selling, actually uh, are doing the pre-sales and uh, the actual sales process, making the customer signing the contract, they are motivated to uh, bring the revenue, right? But they only bring the revenue if they, um, if they get the right customer segment, so the right uh, profile of customers. But this profile definition was not part of the definition for the people who fill the funnel. So they just bring everyone. Yeah? That's their motivation. They bring 100 people a month, new contacts. They are happy. But for the sales guys, for the actual sales guys, they only get one, two, three out of them. So it's a bad motivation. And there are a lot of examples where this goes wrong, where this is just not aligned. Yeah? The process. Uh, the KPIs which are defined for the people responsible for running the process, they are not aligned. They are not aligned with the strategy. And um, analyze always the inputs and outputs of the problematic area. You can't say, hey, my sales department, is, uh, they are the bad guys. No because also they have input parameters. They get input from the product department, for example, where they get the product definitions, the technical specs, whatsoever. Yeah? And with, this, is, uh, this is the material they have to work with. And they have uh, input, uh, uh, let's say, interfaces to the pre-sales department, which is typically running um, from a consulting uh, department, where some people do the pre-sales. Then they have um, uh, with the project management, then they de define the project for the implementation of the customer side. So they have a lot of interfaces. And always have a look at the interfaces. If you uh, don't blame someone in the first instance, yeah? always check why are things in this department going wrong? Is it the department itself? Or is it the environment? Typically, the environment is forcing people to act like or to have a specific uh, behavior. And typically the environment is a trigger which is uh, actually forcing the people not to perform. The people itself, they will always adapt to the environment. If you set up the environment in the right framework, with the right framework, then people will always try to fit in. And if they don't fit in, they will leave. But the framework must be right so that the operations are right. And as I said before, optimizing a change or implementing a change, it's a company thing, it's not a department. Of course, there are some changes which you can implement in a department on its own. But typically, if you have a look at the framework, input, output, involve people in the process, it's a company thing. It's not a department thing. You cannot blame a department on its own or an individual in most cases. Okay, and at the end of the day, most, almost everything is about people. You have to ask yourself the question, are the right people in the right positions? I've met a company, it was very funny, a um, startup, and um, they've been looking how to stuff the startup right now. How did they do that? They sat together, three, four people, so the founders, entrepreneurs, and they said, well, I knew a guy, I did a project with him once, uh, I trust him, he is good, he will take that one. And the other one came up with two guys, the third one came up with three, uh, with, uh, three guys. And after we had a look at these CVs, I mapped them with the requirements. Yeah. 
They asked him, what do you do? What are you doing here? Are you looking for positions for people to like, you like? Or are you looking for people, for things you need to be done? That's a big difference. Always make sure that you need to understand how a position should be um, yeah, stuffed. What are the requirements? Yeah. There's nothing worse than having the wrong people in the wrong places. Because they can't operate. They can't manage. And do they have the right knowledge to manage things? Maybe they are the, the right people, the right person. But we need to educate them. And if yes, if those two points are okay, so the right people in the right places, and they have the right knowledge, then you have to ask yourself, then why do things run wrong? Yes. Always find the root of the cause. And, of course, do not replace people too early in the change management process. We'll come back to that later. Um, always try to preserve the knowledge. Get the knowledge, figure out why things are wrong, and as I said before, if yes, why things went wrong, maybe it's the environment. Maybe the interfaces are, are bad, defined. And in most cases, guidance and education is a better choice except you have someone in who is really disturbing the operation. Then of course you have to act and replace that person. But in most cases really education, but real education, operational education, how to manage guidance is a better choice and invest in company, uh, in uh, education. And uh, this one I like, it was uh, actually I think distributed several times, or it spread around in social media where the uh, CEO is asking the question, yeah, what if we educate them and they leave? Uh, and the CFO will answer, okay, what if we don't in this day? <laughs> uh, they will consume money. Yeah? And you will lose money because they do things wrong. So this is something you always have to keep in mind. Education, of course, is expensive. And, uh, but if it's done in the right way, then it's a very good investment. The environment, I mentioned it already. Um, is the environment well defined? Do they know what is expected from them? Do they have the right targets defined? individual targets which are aligned with the strategy and aligned with the process they work in. Only if you have this well defined, then the people will really push the process forward. And this is a tricky thing. This is not very easy. Um, is the motivation system well defined? Uh, at the end of the day, everyone would like to earn some money. Everyone. Yeah, because uh, you would like to go on vacation, you have to feed your family, you have to pay your rents and uh, rental, whatsoever. So, um, if the motivation system is well defined, and you, as a company, invest in a motivation system, then this is really something which can boost the performance. And motivation system, investing in a motivation system, is something different than it's done in most companies. In most companies, they say, okay, um, what is your 100% target? I don't know, maybe it's uh, 1 million crowns per year, or 2 million crowns. And now they say, okay, and 70% is your fixed salary, and 30% is your value. I'm not sure if this is such an approach you can really implement change and uh, boost the company. If you say, okay, we have a 100% target, no? but I give you 80%, but you can get 120. This is a motivation, because they can overperform. 
and uh, if they can overperform, they of course will try to get their 120%. And they will try to get it also the next year. But if they fail to get their 100% once, and if you have the 100% as a limit, and if they fail it the second time, they, they will just give them. They will say, okay, uh, I will anyway only get the 70% out of my salary, so that's what I live with, so I try to negotiate higher salary next year and um, don't get too much motivated. Um, yes? Relative, but uh, I think that most people uh, will just see the 120% as their 100%. You know what I mean? It's 